Hello everyone, welcome to ID Monkey and welcome to 2018. So this is the first episode of the new year and I'm joined today with somebody you probably have heard the voice of, which is Adam Barrow. Hello Adam. Hi everyone, hi Andy. <laughs> Thanks. So this could be really awkward. We were just discussing that uh, we're both used to asking questions and not answering them. So this may be just a whole lot of questions with no substance behind it. But we'll edit it into something really cool. That makes it sound like we know what we're talking about as usual. Yep. And we also have editorial rights in that we can just choose not to post this if we need to anyway. <laughs> so uh, today I thought what we'd do is we'd go through a bit of a, a review of the last three months that Auntie Monkey has been in existence in the form of a podcast. Um, I actually can't believe it's been only three months. It seems like the amount of interviews and the amount of content we've produced, it feels like a lot longer. So... One thing I thought I'd ask you today, Adam, is, and see here I'm already asking questions, is I guess in terms of the last three months, what are the, some of the highlights that you've kind of got out of being part of Arnie Monkey? Yeah, look, I don't know, mate. It's, 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 it's a pretty cool thing, really, that we're doing. I think that's the biggest highlight for me is that is really getting to talk to some people that you've always wanted to talk to. And, and that's really the benefit of, of being a host, isn't it? You can really target those people and you get in there and ask them all the stuff you've always wanted to know. But I think that's been the best part of it for sure is getting access to some of those people. And we, you know, we're stuck here in Australia. We don't really get to travel um, all the time, unfortunately for both of us. Uh, but I, I really like that being able to just jump on the phone with someone and, and have a chat. And obviously we publish things that are, you know, hour, hour and a half long, but the conversations can be a lot longer than that. And it's just a great way to, to, to meet some interesting people. I think that's really the highlight for me. I think what's really surprised me is just some of the, as you said, some of these people we've always wanted to talk to, just the willingness to actually agree to do these interviews. Um, you know, people that we've never met before have no idea who you or I are, yet they're happy to, you know, do agree, as you said, to a two-hour phone call with a couple of Australians. Do you think they're sorry that they, they've agreed to it at the end of some of these as well? Probably. Go, what did I get sucked into? <laughs> <laughs> and working out ways to hang up without finishing their stories. <laughs> but the other thing that I, I've really enjoyed about it is, the you know, we know a lot about some of these people from all the things we've read or articles or interviews we've seen. But it seems that what we've been really interested in, but also what a lot of the listeners have been asking for, is more about the backgrounds of these people or just under, you know, things about them that we don't normally know or get to find out from them when we're, we're at ballooning events chatting to them about ballooning as such. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's, it's interesting because we've already had a pretty broad spectrum of, of interviewees. And, you know, I really enjoy talking to Kay Turnbull. I've known Kay, as you have, for probably 35, 40 years. And, you know, getting to hear how Kay got into the sport and that involvement is stuff that I just didn't know. And, I've had a lot of people talk to me afterwards going, we didn't know that about Kay. And that's, that just makes her even cooler than we thought. You know, that sort of stuff's really interesting. And that was the example I was going to bring up too because I was in the same boat. It's like, you know, as you said, know someone for years and just you don't know a lot about the non-ballooning or the background behind them. And it's also, I guess, some of the things like, for example, when I was chatting to Brian Jones, you know, we all knew a fair bit about his flight around the world, but... Some of the stuff around what he's doing nowadays, teaching people with paraplegia to fly yeah. and doing that sort of yeah. stuff, it's, that's the bits that I'm really enjoying. And the feedback we've been getting from people online and who we've talked to, it's been the same. It's like, give us more about their background and less about the stuff we know. Yeah, that's right. And, and some, of the, some of the stories that come out are fantastic in that interview with Brian is the, obviously my favourite story in there is the one about uh, Troy Brad leading slugs. <laughs> um, cooking up slugs on his survival camp. That was great. And then had a great conversation with Troy off the record about that as well. And, uh, you know, just, just really funny stuff that happens in the background that, you know, none of us really get to see unless you're there. And those stories, it's really that the social history, I think, that we're capturing is the, is the really cool thing here. These interviews can be around for, you know, another 15, 20 years that people get to, to look back on them, which is great. And we might revisit some of these people too, get some other stories out of them. Absolutely. I think that's it. It's, even though an hour and a half feels like a long time, there's so much more that we could ask them or get into. You know, as, um, for example, when you're talking to Bert Padel the other day, you didn't even get a chance to talk to him about his uh, smoke balloon experience oh. and stuff like that. And it's not until you start uploading some of their photos from their 
you know, of, of their lives that you realize there's so much more that we can be talking to them about. And stuff that we have talked to them about, some of the stuff in editing, as you know, mate, it, we have to chop these things down to a, you know, to an interval that's actually listenable so people don't listen for three hours and burst into tears. Well, but, I, I've worked out how to do that. I chop your talking out and keep the guests talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure many people will be happy with that. So I guess looking forward then to the next year, um, you know, we've, this was a bit of an experiment. We were surprised that we'd even get past a couple of episodes and now we're kind of pushing our 11th, 12th episodes and they have been coming out weekly. Um, I know that you've certainly, and you and I have combined lists of people that we'd love to talk to, which is, I think I was looking at the list just earlier and there was about 28 or 30 people on the list that we've already got lined up. Um, what sort of people are you personally looking for to join us on the on the podcast? Yeah, it's 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 a good question, mate. It's something I've been thinking about a lot. Is I really I really like people who push themselves and push systems, and you know that's why I really like talking to Troy and Bert and and those sort of people. Um, you know that the people who are actually pushing the boundaries a bit and trying new things, and that doesn't have to be. Uh, just the pilots. It's it's, you know, it's the manufacturers. Um, what, what's happening next in the sport is the stuff I'm really interested in. What's happening with technology systems, fabric systems? You know, where where do manufacturers see the sport going? And that's something I'd really like to spend time on. Is talking to all of the manufacturers and getting their views on what's new in their world and where do they see it going? As well as talking to the regular Joes of us who make up the sport. You know, like the majority of the people who just love the sport for going out and flying balloons and and just talk to some of those people and, and see why they love it. And everyone's got a backstory. So I think it's pretty easy to get a lot of good info and a lot of good stories out of people. You just have to ask them. I think that's, and it's an interesting point because, I mean, you and I both listen to a lot of podcasts. We're going to talk a bit about podcasting later. But one of the things that I like to do when I'm looking at similar format podcasts where they're interviewing people is just getting past the whole idea of just listening to ones about people that you've heard the names of. So if they're people that you've never heard of, just listen to it anyway, because it may be on a topic you don't know anything about, but generally you find that there's so many interesting stories in there that you can learn so much about things you just would never even think about learning about because you don't know who the person is or haven't previously had an interest in that that particular topic. That goes for us too, doesn't it? You know, we're talking to people we've we've never heard of in some cases, and who we've got lined up. Some people we've just don't have access to them. So we're also learning as we go, which makes it a bit tricky for us as well. So if there's a few dodgy interviews coming up, that that's not our fault. We're also learning on the fly. That's interesting. I, I find it's easier to talk to people I don't know than to interview people I already know the answers to their questions. So. Yeah, because the people who know you don't like you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Good point. Most people don't like me by the end of the interview anyway. <laughs> the other thing that, I, that I'm really enjoying is that we are getting people requesting people, you know, that they want to hear interviews with. So, you know, we have a limited view of, you know, who's out there and who's been doing interesting stuff. Um, but certainly it'd be good if people continue to just let us know, you know, via Facebook or whatever, of people that you think that we should get on the on the podcast. They don't have to be famous. They can just be people with some great stories. They don't have to have a, a long career in ballooning. They can certainly just have one hilarious story that we can just talk to them about. So definitely reach out to us if you've got some ideas of who we should talk about. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to hear about it for sure. And I guess the other thing that I'm looking forward to this year is that we're, you know, through various ballooning events uh, internationally and here in Australia, we're going to get a chance to actually do some interviews in person. So we've been doing most of it over Skype for the last few months, but certainly can't wait to be able to sit down with people and actually have a physical beer with them rather than us drinking on other sides of the world <laughs> <laughs> and have some face-to-face -face conversations. So you and I will be over in uh, Austria for the Worlds in August next year. So hopefully we'll be able to find some time to pull people aside and have some conversations. I'm sure we will. There's always a good crowd who turns up to World Championships and a lot of, a lot of different people and a lot of different teams. So hopefully we get a heap of interviews out of that. So, okay, so shifting gears a little bit, 
one of the things when we were talking earlier about what we should talk about today and about an hour before we started recording this, I set us both a challenge and I thought what we could do is go and spend the next hour finding out the most obscure or interesting fact or historical happening in ballooning that we either didn't know much about or something that we would like to research so we could sort of throw it at each other and you know maybe sort of find out a bit of information about something that's weird that's been happening in ballooning so who wants to go first ah you can go first i'll lead off right yeah so here's my here's my fact so i like to say way you say you gave us an hour when you told me i had an hour you told me you already had your facts so that's a different story (laughs) but i had the fact i didn't research hadn't researched it yet (laughs) there's the disclaimer (laughs) So here's my fact that we all know, we've all been trained and we all know when Montgolfier days, right? It's 21st of November. First flight, first balloon flight happened in 17, uh, in 21st November, 1783. We're all good on that date. We've all been trained into that. In actual fact, the first balloon ascension with humans on board actually happened 33 days earlier on the 19th of October. What? Am I- He's still there. I think we just broke up. He's stunned into silence. <laughs> yeah, he's stunned into silence. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so I was actually shocked by what you just said. So explain. So 1783 was a big year in ballooning. And that's one of the cool things I love about the sport that we don't talk about much is that there's very few things that happened really uh, in modern terms, modern being from 1700s onwards, that happened so completely from start to finish so quickly as ballooning. Because really from the time that the Montgolfier brothers set their mind to building a balloon, it all happened inside of one year that people took to the air for the first time. But what's really interesting is that the the first flight that we all know about on the 21st of November, prior to that, like any good uh, inventors would do, because uh, there's thousands of people watching this launch, they actually did a number of test flights prior to that now the first couple of test flights obviously we all know the one about the duck and the rooster and all that sort of stuff that's all cool but um with humans they actually did two tethers prior to the actual uh flight itself taking place and that was on the 19th of october so the first time that humans actually flew sustained flight flight they were still attached to the ground so flight's probably a tricky word there but the first time they ascended of their own power was on the 19th of October. And it was actually two people. So the first the first one, what happened was that our old mate, Pilatra de Rosio, who we all know about already, he was the first guy who went up on his own. And uh, he went up to about 80 feet on a rope, stayed there for about four minutes, and then came back down again. So he thought, this that's pretty cool. I'm going to go back up again. He went up to 250 feet this time, so very, very high. And then he came back down again, but he was having a bit of trouble with the, the gondola. It wasn't level, so he kept feeling like he was going to tip out. So then he just had a look around, and he actually grabbed this guy whose name's Andre. Uh, and Andre, he grabbed him and said, uh, you need to come with me, and he popped him into the basket. And Andre's really the star of this story. So his full name is Andre Giraud de Villette. And Andre's claim to fame is, is vast around the world, but he was basically the plant manager for a wallpaper company. So today, not a very high prestige job, but at the time, this guy was known by everybody. He'd been recognised by King Louis XVI. He'd been recognised by the King of Spain at the same time. And their products that he was manufacturing were put into their palaces, both in France and Spain. So he was a famous and wealthy guy in his own right. And it was his paper factory that had created the paper for the Montgolfier's balloon. And so he was standing around and Pilatra said, hey, hey, Bo, get, come and climb in the balloon, mate. I need some weight. So he climbed in and the two of them, they then extended the rope out and they went up to about 320 feet off the ground and they stayed there completely buoyant for nine minutes. And so that flight is actually recorded in uh, the archives, the Royal Archives in Paris. And that's actually the, recognised as the first flight the humans flew and ascended. So it's not the 21st of November. That's the first free flight. But in terms of off the ground sustained flight, 33 days earlier. I think we need to have another day and we should call it Andre Day. 
So, but you got to think about this thing. This this balloon at the time, like it's the blue that we're used to seeing in all the pictures. Yeah. Um, it's got the zodiac signs around it. It's got the picture of the king and suns. It's pretty spectacular, and it's seventy feet high. Now, th- there's pretty much nothing else in Paris at that time that's seventy feet high. And then they go and fly it to 320 feet above the ground. This balloon could be seen from everywhere. And it caused a sensation and really set the scene for the free flight that came in a month later when it really happened. So it was really, really interesting. But the cool part about this guy that I really like about Andre is that he did this flight. He wrote a huge letter about explaining it uh, to, to the uh, French society and said, this is everything I've, I've observed and I experienced in that nine minutes. I think it would have taken him five hours to write the letter um, from his nine-minute experience. And the really cool thing about it is that he was actually offered, when it came to the free flight, the chance to do the free flight, which is obviously with uh, Palatra and with uh, the Marquis, yep. he was actually offered the flight first by Palatra, and he declined it. He said, I'm not interested. And nobody's really sure to this day why he said no. And then subsequently, the marquee was invited to go along and he went for the flight. And the rest is history, so they say. But didn't uh, Louis the Sixteenth was originally trying to get them to fly, the first people to fly to be convicts because he didn't, yeah. want, didn't want anyone to die? <laughs> You're absolutely right. He actually So he prohibited, and that's the reason the, the, the rooster and, and co went for the first flight because he wanted to make sure they could survive. And the sheep was on board because the sheep was considered to have the closest uh, physiological condition to humans. So if the sheep could survive, then absolutely humans could. But that, So they survived and then uh, he'd known they did these tethers and they were okay, but he, he still banned it. It was too dangerous. So, And you're right, he, he actually went to the police lieutenant and said, you've got to stop them from departing. They're not allowed to go. And then he said, okay, you can do it. And as you say, it was with you know, death row prisoners. And then uh, Palatra de Rosa's gone, <laughs> no, 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 we're not letting criminals take the glory of this. So uh, no thanks, King, we'll do it ourselves. And they volunteered and so did the, the Marquis and off they went. So but the interesting thing is that with Andre, he didn't expect to go on the flight, obviously in that first flight, but also he, uh, he never flew again. So he, he actually had that opportunity to go for the first ever flight, but he actually never got, as far as we know, he never actually got back into the air again. And he died uh, four years later of a separate condition of an illness. And so he was only, you know, very, you know, he was very privileged to have that first opportunity, but he's recognised as being one of the first two chicken people out. to take to the air. <laughs> and the first person to chicken out. <laughs> so maybe that's what the, the idea behind the rooster was actually him. He was the chicken. <laughs> Well, wouldn't it be interesting though if we had the chance to talk to him and say, you know, did you regret the decision? <laughs> why, why did you make it? Were you just terrified? Like, you know, we'll never know. And it, that, it is a shame that that's not recorded because it'd be great to know that, that sort of stuff. And, you know, those sort of stories of those side characters, I think, are the really interesting parts in, in the sport. So remember the name Andre Giraud de Villette. Well, the, I mean, maybe he was pretty smart because this isn't my fact, but it's certainly something I, I, I did read about earlier, which was that Rosier, you know, a couple of years after he'd done that first flight, he was actually the first person to have the uh, fatality in a balloon because he decided he was going to try and fly across the English Channel. Right. And he uh, stupidly, in a way, cr- invented what's now known as the Rosier balloon, but rather than using helium, he used hydrogen. So essentially he built a hydrogen balloon that was then heated with hot air. Uh, Surprisingly enough, he blew up 30 minutes after he took off, (laughs) but was sort of famous for being the first man to fly, but also the first person to die in a balloon accident. You know, way to bookend your career. Yep, yep. So think think about that whenever you're flying a Rosier balloon that, you know, it's named after a man that actually was the first one to blow one up. Oh, everyone who's a pilot's also named after him, right? So, <laughs> yes, true. <laughs> oh well, there you go. You've just totally ruined uh, the twenty first of November for everybody. Sorry, thanks. Nineteenth, nineteenth of October. You just got to move it forward a few days. Celebrate both times. Why not? More reason, more reason for champagne. All right. I'm glad we didn't both come up with the same fact. <laughs> <laughs> so over to mine. Um, so I was thinking about what 
an interesting fact that I could come up with. And I thought about uh, what about balloons in television and in the media. And what I remembered was one of my favourite movies when I was a kid, which was uh, Those Magnificent Men in the Flying Machines, uh, which is like a 1965 comedy movie which having watched it just recently is completely on pc and borderline racist <laughs> <laughs> with some of their 1960s stereotypes around uh, various nationalities but anyway uh one of the great scenes in that movie and it's very famous is the uh the the duel that happens between uh the frenchman and the german using blunderbusses in gas balloons. And the, mm-hmm. the scene mm-hmm. is when they're tethered above the sewerage farm on the side of the airfield and they're trying to take each other out with these blunderbusses. So I thought I'd do a bit of research into the history of that and where that came from. And uh, I actually found out that's based on a true story. Is and, it? Yeah. So uh, it all happened in 1808 in uh, Paris where there was actually two Frenchmen and I'm... I don't even know. Oh, should I even try and pronounce their names? I may as well. Just go with first names. I don't have that. They're both Monsieur. <laughs> <laughs> Monsieur Le Pic and Monsieur de Grand Pré. I don't know. That's my attempt at French. Nice. Nice. Um, but basically what happened, these two guys both fell in love with the same opera singer. And they, in true 1800s days, rather than uh, fighting it out properly, they decided to have a duel. But they were both fairly, uh, they were both aristocrats, so they wanted to do it in a, a grand way to have a duel. <laughs> so, so they agreed to uh, have two identical balloons manufactured. And the idea would be that they would use blunderbusses and duel in balloons. So, so I think for, the, for our younger audience, you yeah. should explain to them what a blunderbuss is. Well, come on. They haven't been around for a long time. So for the whole <laughs> audience, basically a blunderbuss is... It's like a cross between a shotgun and a trumpet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way I can describe it. Uh, essentially, it's a very long gun where you pour in a whole lot of gunpowder and you pour in a whole lot of pellets and you stick a stick into it and shove it all down. And terrible, terrible aim, terrible accuracy, and uh, yeah, very much a early period gun that people used to use. So anyway, these uh, two guys got the, uh, their balloons built and they scheduled, I think this was over about four or five months that they planned a date that in Paris that they would send up these two balloons and they'd have this duel. And uh, it's very different from what's in the uh, Magnificent Men and their flying machine because they weren't on tethers. So they actually reported... Wait a minute, that, wait yeah. a minute. Are you telling me that the media have not made a faithful representation of something. Unfortunately, yes. I don't believe it. In a, in a 1960s comedy film. It's oh, you not... can knock me down with a feather. Yeah. But I don't, I'm, I'm sceptical about some of the research here because they actually end up flying a, a, reportedly to around 900 yards, which is over 2,000 feet. Um, on a free flight, two balloons, took off together and going to have a duel from the air with these guns that have no accuracy and no range. But anyway, reportedly uh, one of the uh, pilots first took the shot and absolutely missed. And then the second pilot took a shot and managed to rupture the balloon of the other pilot. And he fell to his death, to the ground. But what I found was quite funny is they both took passengers with them. So not only did the pilot die in this duel, so did his passenger. So another early uh, fatality in ballooning was due to this duel. Um, but the uh, the the, part, the winning sorry, I was going to say maybe maybe that now I understand why Andre refused to fly with Palatra on that first flight. Maybe he expected there was going to be a duel happening at the same time, and he might die as a side side effect of the flight. Most likely. So anyway, I the uh, the winning pilot managed to fly another twenty miles and then successfully landed. But sad end to the story is nobody actually knows whether he managed to hook up with the girl or not as a result <laughs> of this duel. <laughs> So there you go. As much as the uh, the the ridiculousness of the uh, the film is, the balloons and blunderbusses was actually based on a real story. So I think it's another example of uh, of a balloonist trying to use you know his sport to pick up a girl. I think it, we could probably do a whole podcast on that. You know the number you know think when things have gone wrong from trying to impress a girl in your balloon. 
<laughs> the, the worst and the best pickup lines in ballooning, <laughs> huh? Yeah, I don't think we need to relive the 1990s, Adam. <laughs> so how many shots did they get? Like, is it clear, like, could they could they reload the blunderbuss in flight? Like, how many goes did they get at this, or was it just a single shot? I have. I assume it's a single shot because, well, it looks like there was only one shot taken from both. And knowing what a blunderbuss is like, it probably takes half an hour to actually repack it and refire it. So I'm sure it was a bit of a, a one-go shot. And, and knowing, knowing their accuracy, there's a better than average chance that he, you know the guy who died probably shot his own balloon down. Most likely. And I'm just looking at that because if you think about the, a flight to two and a bit thousand feet in two balloons, in early days of ballooning, it's got to have been... Uh, Either they were tied together or they were fairly uh, amazing pilots to keep close enough to each other to get a good shot in there. So it could have been the world's worst duel where the two of them flew off in completely different directions and ended up not actually having a, uh, a fight in the air. But knowing ballooning in those days, chances are one of them would have died in, a, in the landing anyway. So I did, have... like your, I did like your wording where you said, you know, successfully landed. Yeah. It sounds like you've read that verbatim, you know, like that's a... <laughs> We've done it. <laughs> I think that was pretty much it. <laughs> so anyway, that's uh, a couple of interesting facts around ballooning. I'm sure there are plenty more out there. So if anyone knows about any that they want to think's worthy of uh, getting talked about on the podcast, let us know and send us some messages about it. So on the podcasting note, one of the other things that I've found really interesting uh, about releasing Auntie Monkey is not only have we been teaching people about what Auntie Monkey is, We've also had to uh, sort of bring or introduce a lot of people to the world of podcasting. Um, So myself and I know yourself, we we listen to a lot of podcasts. We both spend a lot of time either sitting in traffic or sitting on planes with time to kill. And podcasts are definitely the the best way to do that, I've found, being somebody, especially me, that doesn't ever read books. (laughs) So I thought it'd be interesting to find out, and if you got some... uh, now that people are listening to podcasts, have you got some interesting recommendations for podcasts people could also listen to? I've got, I've got a couple of go tos that I always that I always listen to. I'm a bit of a science fan, so I've got a couple of science ones I listen to. Um, Star Talk Radio, which is awesome, which is um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, he's an amazing guy, absolutely fantastic. Also, the Infinite Monkey Cage, which is Brian Cox. Everyone loves Brian Cox. He's an absolute cracker of a guy. Um, you know, they're both really good ones and they're just interesting because it's fun. They interview people. They talk about relative, uh, you know, relatively interesting topics and, and keep it fairly fresh. The other one that's a, it's an absolute must listen to, I think, for everybody is The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. And that's uh, basically just goes around debunking a whole lot of everyday theories that, that everybody has. It's, it's absolutely hilarious and just shows how stupid we all are on some of the stuff we all believe. You don't have to be a, um, you don't have to be a flat earthist to actually listen to it, do you? No, you don't. You don't. It's it's real. They're all fantastic. They're all absolutely really funny stuff. But I've also been listening to a podcast recently, which is American guy. His name's uh, Jim Harshaw Jr. And it, it's a it's more of a I guess a personal development one. It's called Success Through Failure, and it's really interesting because he does one on one interviews with a lot of the top athletes. Uh, and business people from around the world that he can get access to. And he sort of talks to them about what's worked for them and, and, and what how many times they've failed to get where they need to be and, uh, you know, some of their strategies for honing in it. It's a really, a really positive, uh, strong uh, podcast. I think Jim used to be a, a, a top-level Olympic uh, wrestler and did a lot of wrestling and pro wrestling and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, really interesting, interesting guy. Uh, and the other one I've got, I love music. As you know, I'm right into my music. And uh, there's another one which is, uh, it's a podcast on songwriting. It's it's by a, their own a band called Soda Jerker, and uh, just a really fascinating podcast. And it, it t- deals with a lot of the the top uh, musicians at the moment. It ranges in everybody from, you know, absolutely anybody you can imagine. These guys have had on on the show talking about just how they go about writing songs and experiences they've had in their life. And it's it's really interesting. It's a niche market because it's songwriting, but it reminds me a lot of ballooning because we're also fairly niche as well. So they're talking to people inside the field as we are. So there's a lot of similarities in that. Uh, it's just that they get, you know, ultra-famous, ultra-rich people coming onto the program where we just get ballooners. 
<laughs> yeah, what maybe. about you, mate? What are you listening to at the moment? Well, I was just going to say we'll we'll add some links to the uh, the show page of this podcast to some of these other podcasts. Um, but there's a couple that I listen to. Um, one that I most regularly listen to. It's called the Tim Ferriss Show. So Tim Ferriss is a he's probably one of the most successful podcasters. Um, I think last at last count he had something like a hundred million downloads of his podcast. Um, so ridiculously popular but as a result he manages to have interviews with you know some of the most famous people in the world Um, and what he does is he basically has conversations with these people and really gets into their minds about what sort of drives them to become high performers and tools and techniques that they use to achieve it so some of the interesting interviews are people like Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, Jamie Foxx. Uh, it was a really interesting one. Um, he's, you know, he's talked to people like Richard Branson, politicians, sports people, actors, all sorts of successful people. So it's just really, really interesting just hearing that some of the common themes across a lot of the guests he has in terms of what drives them to become successful. Um, so that's kind of my, my serious one. And then there's a, a couple of sort of light-hearted humorous ones and there was one that i recently introduced you to uh, oh. which is not for the faint-hearted but it's called <laughs> my dad wrote a porno and uh this is it's quite a, a funny premise in that it's uh, a guy who discovered his father had actually written a an adult um an adult fiction book uh called belinda blinked and it's a borderline it's borderline pornography but what is very strange is his dad's a, a 60 year old accountant that has no idea about anything around uh the, the sexual side of things or the female or male anatomy or anything so what happens is each week he and two of his friends read a chapter from this adult fiction book and it is just hilarious hilarious um, it's really very inappropriate and extremely funny yeah it's, and it's, also very disturbing given it's the son reading the father's intimate thoughts. It's not It's not right. Intimate thoughts and fantasies, yeah. <laughs> and it is also, I have to warn you, if you are sitting in a public place like a train or on a plane while you're listening to it, you will spontaneously burst into laughter and people look at you very strangely. So it, that's it's there's true. the warning. Uh, but, yeah, definitely worth listening to it. Uh, and the other one that I listen to quite a lot to is called The Dollop. And that's uh, two American comedians that... Basically, each week they read, one of the guys reads a story from either American history or wherever they're touring at the time. They'll read a story about history that's just completely obscure, completely bizarre. And, you know, being a comedy, they they go into a lot of the detail and a lot of the humour behind it. But it's, you know, very, very interesting hearing about some of this history that you think you know the stories about, but... A bit like what we were talking about earlier is just some bizarre stuff that's happened in in history. So <laughs> sometimes history, I think, makes you know better comedy than stuff that people can make up anyway. So there some sure. of the, there's some of the main ones that I listen to, um, but there's you know there's so many out there. Um, once you get addicted to podcasts, it's it's amazing how how rarely you pick up a book or start watching television. Well, it's like Netflix. You know, once once you get into Netflix, you just go, I'm not watching television again. And, and once you get into podcasts, you, you'll never listen to radio again. Exactly. And you can watch it on your own time. That's what I love about it. It's, you know, you can go in there and, and, and listen to it. And as I said earlier, it's like you can find topics you're interested in, just download a whole lot. And then when you're sitting on a eight hour flight, just listen to a whole lot of content that's really interesting. <laughs> So on the podcasting side, um, one of the things that I just wanted to mention before we sort of wrap up today is it's around um, the Auntie Monkey podcast and look sort of, I guess, pleading or seeing if people can help us out a little bit because doing a podcast, it's not a cheap exercise in terms of hosting all the content and the equipment and things that we need. As you probably noticed, some of the... Uh, previous recordings have been a bit sketchy in terms of quality um so what we thought we'd do is actually set up what's known as a patreon site and patreon is a site that allows content creators whether it's podcasting or artists etc to essentially get people to pledge funding uh, to help out and assist in a a non-profit sort of way 
So what I've done is I've set up a site called Auntie Monkey. Well, it's the Auntie Monkey Patreon site. So if you go to patreon.com slash Auntie Monkey or just go to the donate page on auntiemonkey.com. Oh, sorry, mate. Um, I was just opening a beer then. Uh, could, could you repeat that for the listeners again? <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, so auntiemonkey.com, go to the donate page. And what you can do is you can actually pledge an amount per episode that you're happy to pay. Uh, so I've got a question for you, Adam. What was the last thing you bought for one dollar? Exactly. I can't remember. So in Patreon, you can actually pledge one dollar, and that's for an episode. So can you imagine an hour and a half of content for one dollar? Short of being free TV, uh, is probably paying more for your Netflix account anyway. So that's if anyone, cheap. yeah, if anyone wants to help us out, feel free to go and pledge. You can always unsubscribe from it later on, but anything you can do to help would be appreciated. And the only other sort of plug I just wanted to give for ourselves is that also we'd really appreciate that people continue sharing our posts on Facebook. I know every episode we harp on about it and I thought I'd explain a little bit why we keep going on about it. Um, Many people don't know this but if you are posting anything on Facebook not all your friends and people that are liking your page will actually see it. Facebook's kind of evil in that way and that it filters and throttles the amount of people that see any of your posts so when we post an auntie monkey uh, episode on our facebook page i think as i was last looking it's only about 25 percent of the people that have liked our page end up seeing that post so it takes people to share to get those numbers boosted up so the more people share it not like it but share it it actually facebook starts then getting a broader reach in terms of the number of people that see those posts. So, yeah, that's why we keep going on about sharing and not just liking, because we're sort of trying to fight the the evils of Facebook in terms of trying to promote our content. Do Do you think if we call them evil all the time, do you think they'll actually suspend us? Oh, I don't know. Maybe we should call them like, like... Big business, big corporate, something like that instead. Yeah, that's Maybe right. Maybe not evil. Yeah, I, I don't think we're big enough yet that they really care about <laughs> us. <laughs> I think that's going to be a good problem to have if they start suing us for defamation for calling them evil. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that's just a, a bit of a blatant plug there. But, you know, as we keep saying, please share it. We'll keep reminding you. We are on a mission to not have to pull in advertisers and have ads during our podcasts. So if you can help us out a little bit with a dollar an episode, uh, through Patreon, please do so. Other than that, I think that's all the, the plugs I've got to give. You got any plugs you want to make? No, mate, not at all. I think sharing is really important, and it's also important to tell your friends about it. There's there's a lot of interest, and it's not just for balloonists. Some of the uh, stories we've got are, are being shared by the friends of the people who are also being interviewed who, who aren't balloonists, so family and so on. So, you know, it's really good just to share it and, and get it out there and, you know, spread the love. Oh, and what about what about this year, mate? What what are we going to do this year? What what do you think we're going to target? Um, I think well, we sort of got to get through the backlog of guests that we've kind of put onto our list. But I'd like to try a few other experiments in terms of, as I said, some live podcasts. Um, I think we may start branching out into other areas potentially. So, you know, there's balloonists love ballooning, but there are certainly other areas that there's kind of other areas of aviation or similar sports that some people may be interested in. So maybe a little bit of a variety of content potentially. But at this stage, I think, you know, let's we've got such a backlog of, of great, amazing people that we want to talk to that we'll continue to do that and obviously try and mix it up a little bit so it's not all on the same topics each time. Yeah, and we tend to release, uh, we don't tend to hold on to the interviews, do we either, Andrew? So as soon as we've got them, we tend to, to get them out on, on regular intervals. We don't want to hold, record something now and, and three months later find that it's not relevant anymore. So we tend to release them as we do the interviews. I, I love your term of the word we there. Yeah, well, I mean you. You mean right. you record something, flick it over to me, I edit it, and then I release it. <laughs> it's it's teamwork, mate. Uh, yeah, teamwork. That's it. That's, it. that's what it's all about. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, I think that's enough of us blabbing on. Uh, I think, you know, the next episode will be back to an actual guest and rather than us talking to each other. But, you know, happy new year for everybody. 2018 should be a good year. I think we've got lots of lots of ballooning planned ourselves and a bit of international travel. So really looking forward to it. Happy new year. 
Happy New Year.